Amen. Isaiah chapter 62 is where we're going to be this morning. So if you have your copy of God's Word, why don't you go ahead and get it open. Isaiah chapter 62. So we've been walking our way through Isaiah for many weeks, and in this third section of Isaiah, Isaiah gives us two extended glances at what the future, what eternity will be like. And so we're going to see when we come to the end of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 65 and 66, uh, some extended glimpses into the new creation. But we've been, for the last couple weeks, in Isaiah 60 to 62, and these chapters give us a glimpse of the new city. And the new city uh, has been called Zion all throughout Isaiah chapter 60 and Isaiah chapter 61. And I think what's happening here in the text is Isaiah has been building up the tension. It's as though he wants us to ask the question, is this city that's been talked about, this Zion city, the same city as the Jerusalem that has existed that the people of God know about. And Isaiah chapter 62 is where Isaiah resolves all this tension for us by finally, for the first time in this final section of Isaiah, using the term New Jerusalem. And so we're going to see that Zion is Jerusalem. So we've been studying about this city, and now we see that this city is Jerusalem. And Well, that leads us to a point where we can finally give a definition to what eternity is going to be. And this is going to kind of guide us through our uh, message this morning. What is New Jerusalem? Here's a good definition for you. New Jerusalem is God's people in God's place, under God's protection, enjoying God's provision, and proclaiming God's glory. And some of you are like, can you get another P word in there, pastor? And potentially, it's possible, but this is what they teach us to do so that people pay attention here on Sunday morning. So we've got God's people in God's place, under God's protection, enjoying God's provision, and proclaiming God's glory. Isaiah chapter 62 is going to answer three lingering questions about this new Jerusalem city And the questions that will be answered in this chapter are these. The first one is, how will God's people proclaim God's glory? The second question is, how can we be sure God's people will experience God's protection and God's provision? And the third question is, how will God's people get to God's place? And Isaiah chapter 62 is comprised of three poetic stanzas that will, in each stanza, answer one of those three questions. So that kind of sounds like an outline, doesn't it? So we'll use that as our outline to guide us this morning. And we'll begin with that first question. How will God's people proclaim God's glory? And we'll simply say that the citizens of New Jerusalem proclaim God's glory. And we'll see how in the first five verses of our text. Let's read them together. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet. Until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord. And a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken in your land. Shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Okay, a couple things I want you to notice in the text as we start unpacking it. Uh, The first thing I want you to notice in the text is I want you to notice between verse 1 and verse 2, there's a transition from third person to second person language. Do you see that there? Where it says, uh, Jerusalem's sake Her righteousness, her salvation in verse 1. That's kind of objective. We're observing about someone else, third person language. But then in verse 2, it shifts to your righteousness. The king shall see your glory. You shall be called by noon. What's going on here? What's going on is it's getting personal. And God is going from talking about the land to talking about the people who live in the land. Because what makes New Jerusalem so important is not the piece of property that it is, but it's the people who will live there. And so God's people, being in God's place, you will radiate God's glory. How, how will 
How will God's people proclaim God's glory? They'll do it by showing his righteousness. But who's talking about what's going on in the passage? For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. Who is this I? It's interesting that the second stanza also begins in verse 6 with I. On your walls of Jerusalem, I have set watchmen. So I think that there are different I's in the first stanza and the second stanza. The first stanza is continuing from chapter 61, if you were here last week, when the suffering servant, Jesus Christ, was speaking. And this is a continuation of Jesus, the servant of God, talking. In verse 6, the the tone seems to shift to God talking, the Father. And so why am I bringing this up? Because this is one of the few places in Scripture where we get a hint that the suffering servant, Jesus the Son of God, and God the Father are doing the same thing to accomplish the same salvation. There is, in our triune God, one divine purpose One divine will, the Father and the Son are doing it together. And so we see a glimpse here, even in the Old Testament, of the unity of our triune God. God and Jesus working together to accomplish our salvation. But what is it that they are accomplishing? And what they're accomplishing is the reversal of the situation in which God's people found themselves by rescuing and redeeming people from the destiny that they deserved and giving them a new destiny. And the destiny of New Jerusalem is to be the destiny that the old Jerusalem was supposed to fulfill. So when God put his people, the Jewish nation, in the place called the promised land, they had a job description. And the job that the nation of Israel was supposed to do was go be a light for the nations. Like, they're supposed to show the glory of God, and it was supposed to be a kind of come and see thing. Hey, we're going to show you how awesome God is, so that you're, you're going to want to come and experience how great God is for yourself. And Israel was supposed to draw the nations to worship. The people were supposed to flood to Israel by being the light of the nations. Israel was evangelizing all the other nations on the planet. At least they were supposed to. But on a scale of one to getting the job done, Israel got an F- minus at being a light to the nations. Instead of being a light to the nations, Israel joined in with the nations in rebelling against God, in rejecting God, and in worshiping idols instead of God. So Israel was supposed to be a light for the nations. Israel wasn't a light for the nations. But God said, here in verse 2, the nations shall see your righteousness. So how are we going to get Jerusalem from failure to redeployment as a light for the nations. And that is what Isaiah chapter 62 is going to answer. Uh, Let's pose the question this way. What's the connection between old Jerusalem and new Jerusalem? We said that new Jerusalem is going to fulfill the job description of old Jerusalem, but what's the connection? And hear this. the, The answer is not that New Jerusalem is simply circumstantially different than old Jerusalem, right? Like, if we could just live at a different time, things would be better. If we could just have different global circumstances, if the economy was just a little bit easier, if we weren't dealing with the same hostile world powers, if only circumstances were better, but it's not just that Jewish people needed different circumstances to live in a Jewish land so that they could create a world-dominant Jewish empire. It's not that New Jerusalem is only circumstantially different than Old Jerusalem. Hear this, hear this. New Jerusalem is categorically different than Old Jerusalem. It's not that there are people with the physical DNA of Abraham that are going to make the land of Abraham great. No, no, no. It's people with the spiritual DNA. DNA of Abraham, who are going to live in the land of Abraham and make the land great. The category difference is righteousness. How would the people get righteous? The people in Jerusalem past were so unrighteous that they'd gotten booted out of God's land. 
So how are they going to get righteous? It's not like the people could just call a referendum and put it on the ballot and everybody who's going to go to the poll and vote on the question, should we be righteous now? That's not how it works. We can't just vote righteousness into existence. No, we needed someone to make us righteous. When we were not righteous, when we could not be righteous, when we didn't even want to be righteous, we needed someone who would come along and gift righteousness to us. And that's why it says in verse 2, the mouth of the Lord will give you something that you could not have been given by yourself. And what will the mouth of the Lord give? The mouth of the Lord is going to give a new name. That's what it says there in the text. You shall be called by a new name. See, in the Bible, your name was your identity. And so they would name people something that described who they were as a person. And so when God changes someone's name, he's not just changing the vowels and the consonants that precede their surname. He's gifting them a new identity. And so God says, I'm going to give you a new name. Now, talk to me here, because some of you guys know the Bible a little bit. Can you guys think of a person in the Bible that God gives a new name? Okay, good, good, good. I'm hearing, I'm hearing the two answers I wrote down. This is good. Uh, the first one I wrote down was, was Abraham. So, so there was this dude, his name was Abram, and this was kind of an ironic name because the name Abram means exalted father. And that, that's interesting because the dude was like 100 years old and he had yet to procreate. And so you're wondering like how he got that name. And so God comes to Abram and he said, hey, by the way, I'm going to change you from Abram, exalted father, and your new name is going to be Abraham. Now, I took Hebrew, so I like to, uh, I li- I like to show off a little bit. It's actually Avraham in Hebrew. And so he's like, you're going to be Avraham, which means the father of many. Guy's 100 years old and he doesn't even have a kid. And God's like, you're going to have a lot of kids. Why? Because the children of Abraham that are as numerous as the stars of the sky are the children that have the faith of Abraham. That's you and me and everyone who put faith in Jesus Christ. So, so Abraham got a new name. Here's, a, here's another one I heard. Uh, Jacob. And Jacob got a new name. And Jacob's name literally meant the supplanter or the deceiver. Not an awesome thing to name your kid. But Jacob went throughout life getting his way, becoming rich by tricking people, swindling people, deceiving people. And God showed up. And remember how he changed his name? They kind of had a wrestling match in the middle of the night. And God's like, hey, I'm going to wrestle with you. And he kind of yanks Jacob's hip out of socket. And Jacob walks with a limp for the rest of his life because God wanted Jacob to know that it wasn't his wisdom. It wasn't his trickery. It wasn't his greatness that was going to bring blessing into his life, but it was the hand of God and the blessing of God. And after God ripped his hip joint out and made him walk with a limp for the rest of his life, said, you're getting a new name too. And your name's going from deceiver to Israel. And the name Israel means triumphant with God. And the nation of Israel, named after that father of Israel, was triumphant when they followed the Lord. And so the question is here, Who gets the new name? You shall be called by a new name. Did you know that all God's people get a new name? If you belong to Jesus Christ, you get a new name. John tells us this in the book of Revelation. Check out this verse. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. The one who conquers, I will make him or her a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again shall he or she go out of it. I will write on them the name of my God. In the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. See, maybe you've been defined by a name that screams your past. Maybe you've been defined by a name that screams things you regret. Maybe you've been named by something that has happened horrifically to you, and you just wish you could get past what it is that has been done to you or that you have done. And God says, I'm going to gift you a new name. Name, and I'm going to give you a new identity. Let's talk about how this plays out in the passage because the people of God get a new name. And the first thing that happens as they get a new name is in verse 3. It says, you shall be a crown of beauty. Now, I love that. The transformation of God's people is a transformation into a crown from rags to riches, from rebellious 
to royalty. God says, I'm not just going to remake you, but I'm going to remake you into something beautiful and something wonderful. I'm going to make you a crown. Throughout scripture, we see verses where God's people are called a crown, and it talks about the wonder and the beauty of what God does. Let me give you two examples. The first example is in the book of Zechariah. It says, on that day, the Lord their God will save them as the flock of his people. For like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his land. And just in case you were wondering if the crown was people, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? I love Paul. Paul looks back at his life and his ministry. And he's like, what is my crown? Like, what is the crowning accomplishment of my life? One day we're going to put our crowns before the throne of Jesus. And Paul says, here's the crown that I've got to put before Jesus. The crowning accomplishment of my life is the transformation that has been worked in people's lives through the proclamation of the gospel. And Paul says, look at your life and look at what you were, but look at what you are now because God has changed you. And that's exactly what Isaiah was predicting way back in verse 4. And he says, we're going to take some names that you used to be and we're going to give you new names. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. Like, where did Isaiah come up with those random words? Like, why is he saying that the people's old identity was forsaken and desolate? Here's why, because he's calling back to the beginning of his book. And in Isaiah chapter 6, when he got his commission to be a prophet, here's what the Lord said to him. Isaiah was talking to the Lord. They were kind of negotiating the terms of his prophetic calling. And Isaiah says, "Uh, then I said, how long, O Lord? As in like, how long do I have to talk to these people who aren't going to listen to me? Because that's what Isaiah 6 was all about. And the Lord said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. God says, here's how long you've got to prophesy, Isaiah, until the land is forsaken and the land is desolate. And the definition of old Jerusalem, because of its rebellion, because of its idolatry, because it didn't want anything to do with God, was known as forsaken and desolate. Why? Because most of the people were killed or hauled out as prisoners of war exiles. And God said, that is the future of the land that doesn't follow me. And they became known as forsaken and desolate. And maybe this morning you're sitting in church and you're like, desolate's a good word to describe how I feel. Maybe you're sitting in church this morning and you're like, if you knew what was happening in my mind, if you knew where I'd been even last night, If you knew the things I'd been through, desolate is a good word. I find it interesting, this wasteland, this desolation. It's a picture, isn't it? This desolate wasteland of decreation. That what was created is now uncreated. That the God who made form out of chaos in Genesis 1 is now returning form to chaos because of the sins of his people. And we have a lot of people who are living in desolation and chaos. I find it so interesting in our generation. We live in a generation that has more ability to connect with people via social media than any other generation of all time. We have more entertainment at our fingertips. Like with three swipes of your phone, you can be watching about any movie that was ever created. We have more opportunities to have stuff in front of our face, and yet we are described as the loneliest most disconnected, most depressed generation ever. And I think it's because there's desolation that's hardwired into the heart of everyone who rejects God. And then God comes and he says to the, dis- to the desolate and the forsaken, I'm going to give a new name. And do you see that name here in verse 4? He says, you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land shall be called married. Now, some versions of the Bible, I don't know if you have a version of the Bible like this, but some versions of the Bible don't actually translate that word married. They say, uh, you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land shall be called Beulah. It's an interesting word, the Hebrew word Beulah. Maybe you know of this word. There was a man born in 1948 named Squire Parsons. 
He was born in West Virginia, and he remembered as a young boy growing up, singing in his small church in Newton, West Virginia, a hymn called, Is Not This the Land of Beulah? It's not in our top 40 rotation here at Highland. But one day, after he'd become a high school teacher, uh, this man was driving on his way to work, and he was going through the Appalachian Mountains, and the sun was peeking through in such a way that it was just brilliantly shimmering off the tops of the mountain peaks. And it reminded him of the beauty of the land and that hymn that was so passionately sung in his church growing up. And so when he got to school, he pulled out a pen, and he decided to write his own song about Beulah. And he wrote these words. Maybe you've heard them. I'm kind of homesick for a country to where I've never been before. No sad goodbyes will there be spoken, for time won't matter anymore. Beulah land, I'm longing for you, and someday on thee I'll stand. There my home shall be eternal. Beulah land, sweet Beulah land. I love that picture of the new Jerusalem, that eternal city, the heaven that God is preparing for those who love him. There's something in our soul that longs for a place where we can put down roots and feel at home. And I'm kind of homesick for this city that Isaiah is talking about. It's interesting, though. It it talks about this uh, land being called married or being called Beulah in verse 4. But then Isaiah does kind of what I did, playing with sounds. Um, uh, He he takes the Hebrew word Beulah, which has kind of the root three letters, B-L-L in Hebrew, and he keeps using those in verse 5 because he's trying to pound home the theme. And so you see it here in the English where the word married repeats. For as a young man marries, Beulah is a young woman, so shall your sons Beulah you. And, And... I got to just kind of pause here because that sounds a little weird. Like, let's just think about the implications of what he's saying and try to understand what he means. He's making an analogy. As a young man marries a young woman. Okay, we're good there. Then he says, so shall your sons marry you. Time out. I've got questions. Like, maybe the reason this verse stuck out in the mind of Squire Parsons is because he was from West Virginia and they do marriage a little bit differently there. I don't know. Now, here's what's going on. Here's what's going on. The, the Hebrew word trans, uh, tr- translated Mary, the, this word Beulah, can actually mean two different things. It can mean to get married. It can also mean to possess. And so what it's saying here is your sons will possess your land. It's as though there's going to be a covenant relationship locking God's people into God's place. When God puts his people into God's place, he will so permanently plant them there that it's as though there is a covenant saying that this is where God's people belong. And if you've been looking for a place to belong, if you're wondering where home is, home is in the city that God is preparing for his people. Home is in this Beulah land that God is making for his people. And the people that had lost their place with God, who had gotten booted out of God's land and sent into exile because of their rebellion, are now made righteous because of the work of the servant. Because Jesus, the suffering son of God, went to the cross in our place to take our sin and transform us into righteous people, we now have opportunity to live in God's land. Notice that what defines the people who will possess God's land is their righteousness going forth as brightness. The nations shall see your righteousness. Why? Because when God takes people from rebels to righteous, he does a work inside in their heart that transforms them transforms them from God haters to God lovers, from sin lovers to sin haters. Let me just say this. How do we know that we've got a place prepared for us in the eternal city of God? The text tells us that we know we're part of God's people if righteousness is defining us. Now, I can't make myself be righteous, but Jesus can make me righteous. And so the proof 
of Jesus making me righteous is not that one day when I was a kid, I, kneeled down, I knelt down beside my bed and said a few magic words as a prayer to ask Jesus into my heart. I am not made righteous because one day I raised my hand in a service or walked to the front of a church. Now certainly, certainly there's a starting point for having a relationship with God, and any of those things can be a starting point, but any of those things could be a meaningless ritual if there isn't a true lifelong transformation that follows out of that act. Because the saving work of God is not to get you to make a commitment publicly that lasts for five minutes, but it's to make you righteous in a transformation of your heart that lasts for a lifetime. And so the people of God who have been made righteous by God have a place in the land that God is making for his people. So some questions that you need to ask yourself. Have I been transformed? Do I see the work of grace changing me? Not, are you perfect? Not, have you stopped sinning completely? But do you see yourself growing in righteousness? Do you love God and his word and long to serve him more than you used to? If so, your transformation will be visible to others. What Israel was supposed to do is fulfilled in the people of God as we become a light for the nations, drawing people to faith. As people say, I see what God is doing in your life, and you used to be this, but now you're that. And how do I get that to happen to me? And the answer is Jesus Christ can change you as well. And as all of that is going on, as God is working through the lives of his people to draw others to faith, he's also moving us through life toward the city he has prepared for us in eternity. But that leads us to our second question, like how can we be sure? How can we be sure we're going to get there? How can we be sure that God's people will experience his provision and protection? So we're going to call this second point, God's people will surely experience God's protection and provision. But how do we know? The second stanza of Isaiah 62 tells us, uh, verse 6, On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all the day and all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. The Lord is sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm. I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies, and foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored. But those who garner it shall eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Okay, key word here. Key word in verse 6 is the word watchman. And God says, I have set watchmen on my walls. Who are these watchmen? The watchmen are recorders of historical record. This term appears again in the book of Esther. Do you remember that story? Esther chapter 6, verse 1. There was a a king in Persia, and he'd eaten some bad Persian pizza, and he couldn't sleep, and so he he didn't really count sheep. So what was he going to do? Here's here's what it says. Uh, On that night, the king couldn't sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. So there were these people in Persia, and their whole job was to write down all the cool stuff the king had accomplished while he was king. And so they were writing down, hey, well, the king accomplished this, and the king accomplished that, and the king accomplished this, and the, king accomplished this. and the king's like, I can't sleep. He's like, hey, call all the people who wrote down all the cool stuff that I did, and have them come read me a bedtime story. And the bedtime story is all the awesome things that you, the king, did. And so these people are reading to the king all the cool things that he did. Well, it's, it's the same word. God's like, I want some people to write down all the cool things that I'm going to do for my people. He says, put the watchmen on the walls so they can remind me. So I want you to picture the angels in heaven saying, hey, God, remember, you said you were going to do these things for your people. And the saints of God are saying, oh, Lord, how long until you accomplish the promises that you said would come true for your people? Now, now get this. Does God need someone to remind him of the things that he said he's going to do? Did God get up one day and, you know, oh man, I forgot what I was going to do for my people. Would somebody please tell me the things that I promised back in, in the prophetic books? Would somebody please remind me of everything? No, of course not. God knows everything. He doesn't need anyone to remind him of anything. But he's using human language here to make a point to human beings who are prone to forgetfulness. It's not that God is going to forget his promises to us. It's that we're going to forget his promises to us. And God is saying, my promises to you are so sure that it's as though somebody is standing next to me day by day, getting in my ear, being like, hey, God, remember this is what you said you're going to do for your people. Hey, God, remember that's what you said you're going to do for your people. And why do we need that reminder? 
We need that reminder because we live in a world where things seem to be going wrong more than not. On the road to the city that God has prepared for us, there are trials and troubles that come at us quickly. And those trials and troubles are pictured for us here in verses 8 and 9 as people who come and steal your food and take the grapes that you're going to use to make what you're going to drink. And, and Isaiah said, it's as though God is going to say, the enemies who come in and steal your, your food and your produce and your drink and all of that stuff, they're going to be banished. Well, we don't live in an agrarian economy. I don't think any of you went to bed last night thinking, oh my word, I hope nobody comes into my garden and steals the lettuce and the tomatoes and the cucumbers that I'm growing. You, you didn't think that, did you? But you might have been troubled about some other things that you're facing in life. And when we face hard things in life, we need to be reminded that the hard things in life don't get the final word. Because God's people for a long time have been troubled about the hard things we're going to face in life. Revelation chapter 6 gives us a picture of this. They cried out with a loud voice. They, that's the people of God, that's us. Uh, the people of God cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Like God, how long are you going to let all these horrible things happen before you come and make things right? God, you said we were going to live forever in this city with you. How long until we do? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. And God says to the people, like, how long? How long? How long? God's like, just a little bit longer. Just a little bit longer. And you're like, why? And God's like, because your testimony is drawing other people to faith and there are more who will come in and they're going to be given the same new name, the same white robe, picture of purity that you've been given. And until God's plan for the ages has done, God's people are told to stand firm and hold on. But as we're told to stand firm and hold on, we're given the promise that everything God has said will one day come true. We need to know that what is wrong in this world does not get the final word. I don't know what you're dealing with, but maybe this morning you need to hear that cancer does not get the final word. Maybe you need to hear that suicide does not get the final word. Maybe you need to hear that decay does not get the final word. Maybe you need to hear that aging does not get the final word. Depression does not get the final word. Alcoholism does not get the final word. Violence does not get the final word. Power abuse does not get the final word. War does not get the final word. Suffering does not get the final word. Death does not get the final word word because Jesus Christ himself gets the last word and the last word coming from his lips is behold I make all things new and when Jesus makes everything new we will be in the city that he has prepared for his people and all will be made well how sure is the promise verse 8 the Lord is sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm that's Exodus language. He used his hand and his arm to pull his people out of slavery in Egypt. And God said, if I did it before, I'm going to do it again. And you can trust me and hold on no matter what you're going through because the promise will come true. That leads to our last question. How do God's people get to the place God has prepared? How do we get to the new Jerusalem Last three verses, go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones, lift up a signal over the peoples. Behold, the Lord is proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your salvation comes. Behold, your reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Isaiah loves this way language. He used the way language back in chapter 40, remember? Prepare the way of the Lord. And the idea was you got to make a way so that God can come to his people. Here it's kind of reversed. Now we're making a highway so that the people can get to God. God's like, get rid of all the obstacles, all the obstructions. Here's what life is from the time you're transformed by Jesus Christ until the time you arrive safely on heaven's shores. You're going to walk on a highway straight to the place God has made. You're getting there where God wants you 
But then he says this, lift up a signal over the people. And that's why we're calling this third point, God's people enter under the banner of Jesus because a signal is a flag. And so the question is, what is the flag that God's people are entering under? Like, do you guys remember the Olympics? And at the beginning of the Olympics, every nation carries their flag and they walk into the stadium. Now, this is always annoying to me because the United States is like about dead last in the alphabet. So we have to watch every other nation go first. And so I'm like, can we please get there? And we're watching Cameroon and then we're watching Tunisia. And then there's like one or two people from Madagascar. And I'm like, why'd they have to qualify? We could have like had less nations. And, and then we're watching England and then we're watching Spain and all the nations are coming in. And then finally, the flag comes and the national anthem plays. And this huge contingent of American athletes comes in. And I just feel this surge of national pride. I'm proud to be an American. And, and then I realize, I realize that I've got a better flag. Because my citizenship is not really in America. My citizenship is in heaven. And I come under a different banner. And what is that banner? Isaiah 11 verse 10 tells us. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a signal for the peoples. Now, who's the root of Jesse? Jesus Christ, right? So Jesus is our flag. And Isaiah says, one day, we're going to march into heaven under the banner of Jesus. And step by step, along our journey through life, the banner of Jesus is waving over us. Why? Because it says to a watching world, these people belong to him. It says to Satan and his minions would attempt to harm us. Hands off them, they belong to Jesus. And it says to us that your future is secure because you belong to Jesus. One last cool observation here. Check this out. The Lord is proclaimed to the ends of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your salvation comes. Like, who is the daughter of Zion? It says, go, go to the ends of the earth and find the daughters of Zion. That, that shouldn't have been the case. Because the daughters of Zion, uh, in the time of Isaiah, were the people who were physical descendants of the nation of Israel. So all you had to do was go to the land of Israel, or maybe to Babylon, where a few of them were in exile, but they weren't in very many places. There were like two or three cities around the known world where the people of God would live. But it says here, go to the ends of the earth and say to those people, hey, daughters of Zion, what's going on? Psalm 87 helps explain this to us. Check out what Psalm 87 says. Among those who know me, I mention Rahab and Babylon, behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. So these are like traditional enemies of God's people, right? Like Babylon crushed Jerusalem. Philistia, like that's where Goliath was from, not a, not a big fan of Israel. But go to these lands and say, this one was born there, they say. And the text continues. And of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her, for the Lord Most High will establish her. Check this out. Check this out. Go to Babylon, the people who are God's enemies, and be like, hey, you were born in Jerusalem. Uh, Go to Philistia, enemies of God's people, and be like, you were born in Jerusalem. And the people are like, no, we weren't. Like, I was born in Tyre or Cush or Babylon or Philistia. I wasn't born in Jerusalem. And and, and the author of the Psalms is like, yeah, you were born in Jerusalem. Like, how was I born in Jerusalem? Because your birthplace is not determined by where your mother delivered you. Your birthplace is determined by where the Holy Spirit spiritually delivered you out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. And no matter where you're from, you belong to the new Jerusalem if you belong to Jesus Christ. And all those people are pulled from all those places and brought to the place God is preparing for his people. And they walk in under the banner of Jesus. And they get new names. Do you see the new names in verse 12? Four names. And they'll be called the holy people. No longer unrighteous and impure, but marked by the purity of Jesus that's been given to me. They'll be called the redeemed of the Lord, those who have been bought out of sin by the blood of Jesus. They'll be called the sought out ones, nations, others in our lives saying, how can what the Lord did to you happen to me? And they'll be called not forsaken because never again will God's people be without God's presence in the place that God has prepared. When you hear that, doesn't it make you long for eternity? To live in the place where sin will be done away with once and for all, where God will be with his people and be everything 
that they've ever needed. C.S. Lewis once said, if we find ourselves with the desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. That is the hope of New Jerusalem. We're going to celebrate that this morning, and the band's going to come forward. And we have opportunity to celebrate that by taking communion together. I hope you got your communion supplies as you came in. If you didn't, you can certainly slip out and grab these now. Um, we may have an usher or two who would be willing to grab them and, and uh, walk around and, and help bring them to you as well. But here's, here's the beauty of communion and how it fits into what we just talked about. Because communion is a celebration, first, of what Jesus has done for us so that we can be part of the people of God. But it's also a declaration. And communion is a declaring of, I need Jesus to come into me. The reason we actually eat the bread and drink the juice is because we're saying, I need that which represents Jesus to define me and to come in and be inside of me. And so we're going to first sing about what Jesus has done for us. We're going to sing about how we've been washed by the blood and our yesterdays are gone because of what Jesus has done. And then we're going to celebrate that reality together by taking communion. So as we sing, why don't you just take opportunity to sit and reflect on what the Lord is doing in your life. That you would do business with the Lord here even in the quiet while we sing. And maybe the Lord is calling you to put your faith in him. To run to Jesus for the first time this morning. Maybe there's been something in your life that's been blocking your fellowship or your relationship with God and you'd want to just talk to the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, purify me, cleanse me from this specific sin and get rid of this lie that I've believed would bring me more happiness than you. That as we come to take communion, we would be in a place with pure hearts before the Lord. So let's sing together how all our hope is in Jesus. Mm -hmm.